Hello everybody, uh, you are listening to Through Time and Clades, and uh, my name is Albert. And I'm Joan. And today we're going to continue with our series on uh, the evolution of modern type birds, uh, the series that we call Dinosaurs, the second chapter. And, uh, uh, well, we got a couple of uh, other bird groups to introduce you to today. Uh, but before we get started, um, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm looking forward to the holiday season, getting ready for that, as well as a lot of upcoming exciting things that, that are in our pop culture sphere, as well as uh, related to the sorts of things we cover on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Tet Zoom Con, uh, which will be on Saturday the 12th, so by the time this episode airs, we'll have already passed. Um, but uh, in anticipation of that, uh, I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. This will be my first Tet Zoom Con. Um, which will certainly be the most exciting one for me <laughs> that, I, that I could possibly join because, like, this will this will probably be the largest pet zoo con that was, that's presently been, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing. Uh, apparently, over three hundred people are attending at least. Uh, so I think it's definitely going to be by far the the biggest to date. Um, yeah, and I'm really glad that you can join us this year. Um, of course. Uh, Things being what they are, uh, it's going to be held online, which is why it's being called a Ted Zoom Con, um, which is, a, I guess, kind of a silver lining because that means uh, people from all over the world are probably going to be joining us. And um, yeah, super exciting. Uh, Ted Zoom Con is always a lot of fun. Uh, and on, on the off chance that you are not familiar with what Ted Zoom Con is, it is a um, annual convention run by a paleontologist Darren Nash. It's a, you know he he runs a blog Tetrapod Zoology, and the convention is named after it. And so every every year he invites uh, people from you know many different backgrounds related to the subject of tetrapod zoology. So you know not not only academics necessarily, although there are plenty of those, um, uh, but also people who work in conservation or um, uh, work closely with certain types of animals. Uh, people who make films about wildlife, things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's a, always a very, very varied bunch of presenters, and um, and there, there's often a very strong a paleo art theme as well. So there's going to be a paleo art workshop this year. I wonder how how that's going to go with the online format. In any case, um, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it too. Yeah, this is my first time actually using. Well, this will be my first time actually using Zoom. Hmm. Um, I've not been in a position where I've had to acquire it. Mm -hmm. Unlike say, my sister, for example, who had to do her schooling online to teach the kids. Yeah. Um, but uh, as I understand it, it's basically the same as like well, maybe Facebook Messenger or Skype. Yeah, it's, it's similar. Yeah. Tools here and there. Um, so, but fingers crossed it all works out well. I went and downloaded it. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited for it. <laughs> <laughs> super yeah <laughs> uh so yes uh, by the time you'll be listening to this episode uh that'll, that'll be done but uh, i think we'll we'll be having a good time i uh, i can't foresee it going any other way i think <laughs> do you think there's a chance that this will be recorded and uploaded for folks to see that's a good question uh last i last i heard um i i think it's I think the status on that was uh, unsure, uh, but yeah, I probably have to ask Darren to to be uh, more more sure about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm very curious about. So I, I know there's um, in the in the I guess in the middle there's like a lunch break sort of thing um, where everybody can get in contact with each other. I am very curious how that's going to work out. Yeah, um, I, I I can't realistically see 300 plus people with their cameras on. <laughs> right. With <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> i i know um i know zoom has a function called a, like breakout rooms where you can like split off into smaller groups and talk within them but um so i i'm guessing that's what they're they're gonna use but uh yeah I, I, we'll we'll see how it goes I, i'm definitely curious as well <laughs> yeah that sounds good <laughs> um what about on your end of things albert Ah, uh, so yeah, um, as I mentioned, I'm also looking forward to Ted Zucon, but uh, other things are happening too. Um, so there's a there's a conference, uh, an academic paleontology conference happening next week called a Paleontological Association Conference uh, that also happens uh, yearly. And uh, it's called PALAS for short, uh, which some people like to snicker at. But, um, 
Um, yeah, so I'm I'm preparing a, a talk uh, on my research for for that conference, and so I, I've been busy doing that. Um, it, it's probably going to be pretty similar to the talk I gave at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology conference um, earlier this year, a couple months ago. So uh, Palas is uh, unlike SVP, uh, Palas is uh, not not solely focused on um, vertebrate paleontology. So there there will be talks on. Uh, invertebrates as well, maybe even some plant talks. Uh, I, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but um, yeah, so it's uh, it's gonna be the last uh, last conference I attend this year, and as with pretty much all the other uh, conferences this year, will be happening online. Um, let's see, anything else? Um, I, I guess I've I've also been kind of progressing a bit with my research stuff. Uh, that's still going. Um, and I, I've been reviewing some some papers, uh, you know, doing the whole peer review thing. And that's kind of kind of the way we, uh, one of the ways we scientists give back to our, our field, uh, review other people's papers, and make make sure they're all uh, scientifically sound in that, and that uh, you know appropriate for being published in a in a journal. So I've been doing that. There's definitely some uh, exciting papers that I, I've I've been looking at for that. Uh, but of course, I'm not allowed to talk about them until they come out, so I won't. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> well, lots of things going on. But um, well, sweet, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to mention? Uh, not particularly, no. All right. Uh, I, I guess we can get started with the main subject then. Uh, so let, let's talk about some birds. <laughs> Woo uh, so um. Uh, this episode uh, will focus primarily on a group of birds called the gruiforms, and so I have on this cover slide a couple of, well, not more than just a couple, there are some in the background too, uh, okay, several cranes. Uh, so gruiforms includes the cranes and the rails, and as we shall see, some other groups. Um, but uh, in addition to the gruiforms, uh, we'll talk about another bird group in this episode as well. So let's move to the next slide. And so, uh, yeah, so this bird is a, is a bit of a loose end. So if you remember um, back when we were introducing the group Neoaves, uh, Neoaves is a group that contains 95% of all living birds. Basically, they include all living birds except for the um, ostrich-like birds, the duck-like birds, and the chicken-like birds. Everything else is a Neoavian. Um, and... Uh, we talked about how the you know the interrelationships between all the major neo-avian groups has been really tricky for us to figure out, and uh, I I showed uh, based several times a polytomy, which is basically a way of um, depicting uncertain relationships. Uh, so instead of showing a strictly bifurcating tree, we uh, show several lineages branching out from a from a point, um, and, and some some people actually think that. This might actually be a literal um, hard polytomy where uh, basically all these different groups originated pretty much simultaneously. And so that's why we can't figure out what their, uh, or at least we can't figure out the relationships in terms of a strictly bifurcating tree. But even if that's not the case, um, we often pre present um, uncertainty in relationships that way anyway. Uh, and so that's what we call a soft polytomy, so a, a depiction of uncertainty by, by not kind of choosing what kind of branching order specifically um, we, we show the tree in. And so um, pretty much all of those major groups we showed back then um, are composed of more than one living species. So we've at least figured out, um, you know, what uh, at least one close relative of a, of all birds in that polytomy, except for one particular species, which is kind of on a branch all on its own in that polytomy. And then that is this one, the Hoatzin, which is only known from one living species. Um, although we do uh, know of some additional ones in the fossil record uh, from the Eocene onwards, and I'll show a few pictures of them uh, in a later slide. So the Hoatzin today is uh, found in South America, although stem Hoatzins are known from Europe and Africa. Curious. And the Hoatzin is a really, really weird bird. So I um, think uh, one of the weirdest things about it is that it feeds mostly on leaves. And that's pretty rare among birds. There, there aren't many birds that specialize in eating leaves or in kind of you know, leafy vegetation. And the thing about eating leaves is that, um, you know, 
this kind of vegetation, it's often full of uh, plant fibers, and animals can't usually uh, digest fibers on their own. Uh, this is the case for us, for example. If you eat a lot of fiber, it just comes out the other end of you, uh, you know, pretty much un unchanged. Um, so herbivorous animals, uh, animals that do specialize in eating uh, leaves and such, uh, usually have to recruit the help of bacteria. And so usually uh, herbivores have a, you know, part of their, their digestive system that is specialized for housing bacteria. The, the food they ingest, the, the plant material they ingest, will sit in that uh, fermentation chamber for a while where the, the bacteria work on processing the fibers. Um, and so that, that's how they manage to uh, digest uh, their, um, their food. And so the Hodgson is similar. The Hodgson has a fermentation chamber in its digestive system. And in the case of the Hodgson, uh, the fermentation chamber is in its uh, crop and its esophagus. So the esophagus is, of course, the, the tube that connects the, the mouth and the, the stomach. And the crop is a pouch that is found in birds at the base of the esophagus, which in most birds is used to store food, uh, kind of a temporary food storage uh, location. Um, and in the Hodson, it also serves as their fermentation chamber, so the crop is greatly enlarged. And the, the crop and the back end of the esophagus actually have multiple chambers in them uh, for housing bacteria. So it, it's basically using a strategy that's pretty similar to something like a cow. Though you might have heard that you know cows have many stomachs. Um, well, what they really have is kind of a stomach that's split into many, many chambers, um, and the, the bacteria live in those chambers. So... Um, the Hoatzin has this really weird digestive strategy that's not found in any other living bird. Uh, something else that's very unusual about the Hoatzin uh, that gets quite a bit of attention is that uh, the juveniles are able to climb using claws on their wings. And uh, there are um, a number of misconceptions that are related to this behavior. Uh, and one of these is the idea that the Hoatzin is unusual for having claws on its wings in the first place. Um, it, actually, uh, many modern birds have claws on their wings. And if you if you eat a lot of chicken wings, you might have noticed this from time to time. Um, now, I, I know the, the claws sometimes get removed during, you know, while processing the food and, or before they're, they're sold even. Um, but definitely, I, I've eaten my fair share of chicken wings that still come with the claws, and they're, you know, quite quite apparent. I was going to say, same here for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, next time you eat, eat chicken wings, uh, pay pay close attention, and you might notice them too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what is unusual about the Hudson is that uh, it uses these claws for, for something, or at least it does as a juvenile. So in, in most modern birds, uh, the claws are very small, and uh, it, it doesn't seem like they, they're really used for anything. They just haven't been lost, probably, because uh, you know, they, they don't really have any kind of disadvantage that comes with them. Um, but uh, the juvenile Hoatzin will actually use these claws for climbing through branches. And, and what, what they do is that um, Hoatzins often nest in, um, in trees that overhang water. And so if the juvenile Hoatzin is threatened by a predator while in the nest, uh, what it'll actually do is actually jump down into the water below the tree uh, and kind of swim around for a bit until the predator goes away. And then once it's safe, it'll actually climb back into the tree using these, uh, these wing claws, as well as the claws on its feet as well. You know, that, that does make it unusual because there, there aren't really many other birds that do this. Um, another uh, misconception that is uh, related to this, uh, this, um, this behavior is that uh, the Hudson is some kind of a missing link that, uh, it, or, or, or a living fossil. That it's kind of retaining this kind of behavior from an earlier kind of proto-bird. Like, you know, you, often people draw comparisons to Archaeopteryx because that's been known for, for a while. Uh, and of course, um, a lot of the Mesozoic bird-like dinosaurs uh, had wings with uh, very well-developed claws on them. And, um, and people have speculated that they might might have used them for climbing trees or whatever. Um, it's actually kind of controversial, like how well these dinosaurs could climb and whether how much time they were spending in trees and things like that. But uh, because of this, uh, people will often bring up the hots and as oh look, you know, it, it's a kind of a relic of of the ancient past. It's uh, performing the same kind of behavior that it, its distant Mesozoic ancestors would have. And uh, well, there, there's actually absolutely no evidence and pretty pretty much no reason to think that is the case. Um, 
we know that the Hoatzin is, uh, you know, quite probably quite far removed from uh, the distant uh, ancestors of um, of modern birds uh, that that had these large wing claws. So um, this almost certainly isn't uh, isn't a retained behavior from a, a non-avian dinosaur ancestor. Um, if anything, uh, it is probably something that independently evolved in the Hoatzin, if it's shared between it and the ancient uh, Mesozoic non-avian dinosaurs at all. Um, so it's kind of a unique uh, derived trait that the, that the Hoatzin has. It is not a, not a relict behavior. Um, let's see, do you have anything else to add about the, the Hoatzin? Uh, nope. Yeah, it's really weird. Uh, let's go to the next slide where I show a diagram of its digestive system from a paper that basically describes a digestive system. And you can see here that the um, uh, labeled A is the enlarged crop, and you can see how big it is compared to the rest of the digestive system. Um, the segment in B uh, is the rest of the esophagus and leading on to the stomach, which is C and D. Yeah, the back half of the stomach is the gizzard in birds, which is used for grinding up food, so that is D. You can see that the you know the, the stomach is unusually small in Hoatzin, but the crop and esophagus are very large and have multiple chambers to house their fermenting bacteria. And also because of this unusual digestive system, the breastbone, the sternum of the Hoatzin, which is labeled E, has a very unusual shape. So uh, in you know pretty much all uh, flying birds uh, that are alive today, there is a um, large keel on the bottom of the sternum for attaching the flight muscles. But because of this very large crop in the Hoatzin, the keel has kind of been, you know, reduced uh, backwards, um, so that it is um, the front half of the sternum it does not have the very tall keel anymore. It's kind of limited to the back half, um, so that is very unusual. And uh, probably because of this, Hoatzins don't really tend to fly very far. They'll they'll fly between trees, they'll fly from tree to tree. Um, but uh, they, they don't like to fly very much. They spend most of their time just sitting in the tree and digesting their diet of leaves. So yeah, that very weird, very distinctive um, skeletal anatomy. And let's see, on the next slide, yeah, I have uh, images of a few fossil Hoatzins. Now, uh, the fossil Hoatzins that we have are not spectacularly complete, uh, as you can see here. So um, Protoazin from the Eocene of France is you know, here I'm showing a, a coracoid, a shoulder bone here. Um, and for Namibiavis from Namibia, uh, I've shown a coracoid and a humerus, uh, the upper arm bone. Um, and this is pretty much close to most of what we have for these guys. So uh, they're not super complete. We can recognize them as Hoatzins, um, but uh, they don't tell us too much about uh, their anatomy or biology besides that. But something that is interesting about these fossils is where they're found. So I mentioned that the Hoatzin is only found in uh, South America today. But we have these fossils from Africa and Europe. And so far we have not found fossil Hoatzins in Asia or in North America. So that kind of begs the question, you know, how did Hoatzins get to South America in the first place? So. One possibility is that they could have crossed over uh, from via the Bering Land Bridge, which a lot of other animals did, and moved to North America. And then eventually when North America became um, connected to, to South America via the Isthmus of Panama, uh, moved down to South America afterward. But uh, that is not supported by the fossil evidence because for one, we haven't found any fossil Hodgson's uh, from North America within that time frame. Um, and for another, uh, we actually find uh, fossil Hoatzins in South America before the Isthmus of Panama formed. And even though we can't really tell much about these fossil Hoatzins uh, because of limited amount of skeletal material, uh, because of their very similar kind of, you know, forelimb and shoulder girdle anatomy to the modern Hoatzin, uh, we can infer that they probably also didn't like to fly for very long distances. Um, uh, you know, similar to the modern Hoatzin. So, uh, they probably didn't fly across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to get to South America. So that leaves another possibility, 
which is that instead of flying over the Atlantic or you know going a long way around via the Bering Land Bridge, they might have rafted to South America instead from Africa. Now that is a very interesting idea, um, and it sounds, I, you know, the idea of you know, rafting across an ocean sounds pretty crazy when you you know think about it on the surface. Um, but uh, for one, it is the the best supported uh, in terms of uh, it is the most consistent possibility with the fossil evidence, and also it is maybe not as unlikely as a lot of people might think. So when we're talking about animals rafting to uh, distant land masses, uh, we're not actually talking about, you know, a kind of rickety a log, like a single log falls in the ocean with an animal on top of it, it just drifts to, to an, an, another bit of land. Um, uh, what is more likely to have happened is that a big chunk of terrain uh, got washed out into the oceans, so, uh, you know, uh, basically a floating island that is many many meters long and you know maybe maybe covered in several trees and vegetation and there might have even you know been been plenty to eat on there uh, there might be fresh water trapped in nooks and crannies uh, maybe rainwater uh, would would get trapped in there when when there was rain um, and you know with it would carry it, it would carry um, you know possibly many different animals on the on the raft um, and uh, of course, even then, uh, the chances of it uh, making to another landmass and the animals on top of it surviving might be pretty low. But given enough time, uh, this kind of thing does happen, uh, and we have actually observed it happening. Uh, we do know that rafts of this nature and size uh, get washed out into the ocean, and we have seen animals get washed up on distant landmasses um, on top of rafting material. Um, so it is actually entirely plausible that uh, some types of animals could have made it across oceans this way, and this seems to have happened, uh, you know, this kind of rafting from Africa to South America seems to have happened not only for the Hoatzin, but also, uh, if you recall in Jones' series on uh, human evolution, also for the New World uh, monkeys as well, um, and as well as the um, uh, caviamorph rodents, which are the guinea pigs and capybaras and their relatives. Uh, so, you know, that it is a pretty consistent pattern we see in some groups of these uh, South American animals, and apparently here we have an example of it happening in birds. Um, so, something kind of an aside, but I guess I I thought I'd mention it because it's interesting. Um, kind of the the idea of um, dispersal being a major agent of animals arriving on distant land masses uh, is a kind of um, a relatively recent thing in this in the scientific community because uh, for a long time it was assumed that uh, animal distributions were primarily um, uh, explained by vicarians, and we mentioned this term when we were talking about paleonates, which is basically animals stay on land masses and uh, they kind of just, you know, follow plate tectonics, uh, and stay on those land masses, and wherever the continents go, they follow, and that's that's how they end up in the present day distributions. Um, but in more recent times, we're starting to realize the importance of dispersal more uh, for um, you know uh, for explaining animal biogeography. And uh, this is a story that's uh, pretty um, pretty well told in a book called um, The Monkey's Voyage, which I highly recommend. Um, and uh, something else to mention is that the Atlantic Ocean is you know, gradually getting wider uh, as time goes on at the moment. And so during the Paleogene, uh, when this, these rafting events might have happened, the Atlantic would have been somewhat narrower than today, and that would have further increased the chances of this type of thing happening. Um, all right, yeah, I think that's a, that's the main story I wanted to tell with the fossil Hoatzins. Uh, do you have anything to add? Well, certainly, uh, uh, dispersal is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Just the way that all sorts of organisms have been able to colonize such far-flung places as islands to apparently entire continents like right. South America. Um, and it's amazing, like, the kinds of animals and plants that are able to do this. Right. Um, I think about coconuts, for example. Coconuts are a bit of a conundrum in the botanical circles because the way that their seeds can float in the ocean for, mm. for you know weeks and months at a time and not you know succumb to dehydration from the salt water, 
they've been able to colonize like almost all the tropical regions of the world. Right. It's been hard to figure out where exactly they originated because <laughs> they're, they're right. everywhere. <laughs> and then things like uh, giant tortoises, and you, you see mm. like the Galapagos tortoise, and you think, oh, that's a that's a hefty land living animal. There's no way that could have possibly made it to the islands easily. Well, right. it turns out they actually swim fairly well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can float. Uh, and they they can, you know, live for a long time without food and so they, yeah, they they sometimes get washed up on islands and then that's a that's another thing that people have actually observed happening. Um, so what I think is really cool is um I remember my my introduction to dispersal. Mm -hmm. Um I had the uh, the Life Nature Library growing up, which mm -hmm. was this old series of books from the 80s and 70s that you just talk about natural history. And each book had a various topic, um, and they had the one on ecology where they talked about this first one. They were Katoa eruption of, mm. ooh, I want to say it was uh, 1883, and of course this volcano blew its top and basically destroyed everything on the island. It was it was a major tragedy. A bunch of people died. Mm. Um, the entire ecosystem was wiped out. But then over the course of like a few weeks to a few months yeah like animals started washing up on the shores spiders were writing little bits of their web and just landing on the island mm -hmm. seeds would be attached to like the legs of birds that were passing by and they'd get planted on the island and over time the whole ecosystem replenished itself yeah and it became as it was before more or less right and so that always just stuck with me growing up yeah, that that that's a that's a classic study in kind of island colonization and you know by you know different forms of life and yeah, that really an amazing story. Um, so we we will see a dispersal show up again uh, uh, in in this episode. Uh, it it definitely has been important for birds, of course, because uh, even though the Watson is not not. Uh, not much of a long distance flyer. Uh, there are other birds that are capable of very long distance travels and uh, have managed to colonize very distant and remote land masses that way. And we'll see that in a bit. <laughs> so on the next slide, yeah, so I do want to talk a little bit about this. So, um, so one thing that the fossil Hoatzins don't really tell us about is what the Hoatzin actually is. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we know it's a bird. We know it's a crown bird. Um, but um, what other group of bird is most closely related to as something that has vexed ornithologists for a long time? And it's still unresolved. Um, so for, for this reason, I, I, I often call the Hoatzin the most frustrating bird in the world. Uh, well, it certainly is if you're a phylogeneticist, because there's just absolutely no consensus on what kind of other bird it is related to. Um, and so there have been many different alternative hypotheses proposed. Uh, I've listed some of them here. This is not even all of them. Um, and not all of these ideas are considered likely anymore. But uh, you know, just just to give you an idea of the diversity of ideas, <laughs> um, I I decided to to list a number of them here. And so a very um, a very long held idea was that the, the Hoatzin was a kind of galliform, a kind of chicken like bird. And you know, looking at it, you can tell you you can see that it looks kind of chicken like. Um, it, it has a few galliform like features. Now this one, um, even though it was a um, long considered kind of a leading hypothesis uh, traditionally um, is, is no longer uh, thought to be likely. Uh, we are now pretty sure that the Hoatzin is a neo-avian bird, um, so belonging to with the um, remaining 95%. But even within this group, uh, we do not know what it is. Um, another popular idea uh, is that it's closely related to cuckoos or to turricos, which are you know, it's sometimes considered to be close relatives to each other. Um, and it certainly has uh, several features that are um, uh, that closely resemble cuckoos and or turricos. And turricos are also these you know tropical uh, tree dwelling uh, herbivorous birds. Uh, so it's understandable that they, they have many similarities. Uh, but as far as we can tell with the current evidence, this seems more likely to be convergent evolution. Uh, so we also don't really think that the Hoatzin is probably that close to, to cuckoos and turricos anymore. Um, one idea that 
hasn't really taken off, but is pretty intriguing, uh, is the idea that it's close to a group called the Seriemas, uh, which are another South American group. Um, in fact, they are the closest living relatives to the extinct terror birds. Uh, we haven't really talked about terror birds and Seriemas in this series yet. Uh, we'll get there eventually. Um, well, uh, it's an interesting idea. They share some uh, uh, intriguing similarities with the uh, with the Hoatzin, um, but um, again, not has hasn't really taken off. It was never a really big thing. Um, some of the early molecular studies that were done on the Hoatzin put its sister to pigeons, um, and uh, even later on, there were some other um, large scale molecular studies that recovered. A group of neoavians called uh, metavies, or that was given the name metavies, and so it was kind of a, a mostly assemblage of neoavian birds that included things like the, I think, like the pigeons, the flamingos, and grebes, uh, turricos, and cuckoos, and um, tropic birds, uh, sun bittern, and kagu, and uh, uh, strysorians, um, and and the hoats in, uh, included in the mix of that all that. Um, but it turns out that uh, metavies is pretty much only supported um, by like one specific gene, uh, so it is now considered likely to be an artifact and is not not actually a real group. So uh, probably that that's not where the Hoatzin goes if it's not a group that actually exists. Um, more recently, so I've, I put like the more recent uh, results uh, from kind of large scale molecular phylogenetics uh, in bold in this list. Uh, more recently, uh, there have been studies that find the Hoatzin as sister to a group composed of the uh, Gruiforms, which we'll talk about soon, uh, as well as the Shorebirds, Caradriformes. Um, so this group is not found in all recent studies, although some of them do find it, and uh, some studies have placed the Hoatzin as the closest living relative to this group. Um, but others have found it um, as the sister to a group called Telleravies, which is a very diverse group, uh, mostly tree-dwelling birds, uh, things like songbirds and parrots, and birds of prey and woodpeckers, um, definitely uh, super diverse, and they found that the Hoatzin is a, a sister to those guys. And uh, very recently, there was a study that found uh, the Hoatzin as the closest living relative of Strysores, which would be quite surprising if it were true. Um, yeah, we, we talked about Strysores in the in the last episode uh, of Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, and so that, that's a group that includes things like swifts and hummingbirds and nightjars and so on. Um, so as someone who has looked at uh, various Strysorian skeletons, I, I would be surprised if this was true, uh, because uh, Strysorians are definitely very different from Hoatzins. I, I don't see much similarity. But on the other hand, you know, the Hoatzin is... It's so weird, right? Uh, that almost anything could be true at this point, um, and certainly even with these large-scale molecular studies, we're we're still having trouble figuring it out. Um, so pro probably the reason for this is, is that it probably is not particularly close to any other specific living species of bird, um, and so what this um, you know when when we're dealing with lineages where this is the case, we often run into a phenomenon called long branch attraction, which is a big problem uh, in reconstructing phylogenies. And so what this means is uh, basically uh, we're dealing with the with a branch where there are a lot of changes have accumulated along that lineage. And all right, so uh, it's a bit of a, a vague concept, but uh, you know, bear with me here. Uh, so if you think about you know how we reconstruct phylogenies, we basically look at you know, to try to assemble a data set of many, many different traits, whether they are morphological or molecular traits. And we assemble this big data set, um, you know, with kind of the, with, for each trait, we uh, label what condition it is for every uh, species we include in, in the analysis. And okay, so you have all these traits. Well, uh, there comes a time, uh, you know, there, in theory, uh, two lineages can be maximally different from each other in all these traits. So it, it may be that two lineages have a different condition for every single one of these traits you include in the analysis. All right. Well, uh, what happens if each of these lineages continues to evolve and then one of those traits changes? Well, then suddenly, when they were maximally different before at some point in their evolution, they suddenly become more similar to each other again because one of these traits changed back from the maximally different condition, right? Does that make sense?
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when this happens, uh, you can get a lot of artifacts that result from these analyses because uh, the analysis now thinks that these two branches are more similar than you know their common ancestry actually indicates, uh, and so you get uh, some lineages getting drawn artificially towards others. And so this may be what's going on with the Hoatzin, uh, is that it has changed so much from whatever its last common ancestor was with whatever living bird group it's most closely related to, that uh, analyses are having trouble resolving it correctly with its closest relatives um, because it has gone through this uh, kind of because it is on the end of this very long branch. And as I mentioned before, the, the fossils that we have so far um, are not super informative about uh, kind of the ancestral uh, states, uh, what the, you know, what the ancestors along the Hoatzin lineage were like. Um, well, one of the ways we can uh, kind of um, combat uh, long branch attraction is by including fossil taxa, because of course fossils show the intermediate stages leading up to the, you know, very, very derived modern condition. And so uh, if you have a full set of these tran transitions, then you might be able to resolve the um, modern taxa correctly in the in the right place. But of course, uh, the fossil record for Hodgson's is pretty limited so far. So hopefully we can find some more complete uh, early fossils at some point, which might help us resolve this problem. But, um, you know, for now, uh, it is really a, an enigma in uh, bird phylogenetics and definitely one of the biggest remaining problems, uh, not only in bird phylogenetics, but probably vertebrate systematics in general. Um, and so definitely uh, quite the quite the weird bird species. Uh, do you have anything else to add? Hmm. I, think I, can, I think I can solve this mystery. Uh, yeah. All right. Here's, here's my completely scientifically accurate parsimonious explanation. <laughs> All right. So Watsons are aliens, are alien <laughs> birds. And they landed on the surf on the surface of the earth and they were particularly lonely so they see all these different kinds of birds and they they, they give the relationships a <laughs> shot you know? but for every single reason it just it just did not work out you know, they, they were or something and so after eventually settling in about uh, contenting themselves to a, a sad lonely existence as watsons eventually scientists come along to try to figure out the relationships between birds and then their genes are just all over the bird family. <laughs> that's what happened. Well, you know what? Uh, that's as good an explanation as any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, okay, okay, that, that's... Probably not the case, uh, needless to say. But you know, at at this at this point, <laughs> I don't think I would be hugely surprised if we found that Hoatzins were aliens. <laughs> I mean, they're certainly weird-looking birds. I mean, clearly aliens look weird. <laughs> right, right. There she goes. <laughs> yep, uh, irrefutable evidence right there. <laughs> <laughs> In, in all serious, no, this is, I mean, this has fascinated me for years. I mean, obviously growing up in all the books, you know, it was either a galliform or it was included with the cuckoo, mm -hmm. the Turico, but there was always a little bit of text that said, but this is probably not right. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, 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 the mysterious bird, what is it? Right. Um, I, I, I am confident that this probably will be solved within the near future. I mean, uh, a matter of, you know, more, more phylogenetic analyses, better fossils that could be included in, as you were talking about, mm. to kind of combat long banter fashion. Um, I, I, I'm optimistic that we're on the horizon with mm. this bird. Yeah, I, I, I think eventually we'll, we'll find a home for it. But uh, yeah, for now, uh, definitely, uh, it remains frustrating. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, because of this, uh, I, I could have uh, justified uh, kind of putting the Hoats in anywhere in this uh, in this series that we're doing. Uh, I kind of put it here because uh, we're we're kind of we're sort of at the midpoint. Not not of this entire series, but um, if you remember the big um, ten-way polytomy of neo-avians that I showed, 
uh, previously. Um, we're, we're kind of uh, halfway through going through the major groups there. Now, some of the major groups I'll come on later uh, will take several episodes to go through, so that's why we're not actually halfway through the series yet. Um, but um, uh, we are halfway through getting through the major uh, neo avian groups that contribute to that, that polytomy. So uh, that, that's why I decided to put the hoats in here. Um, in any case, uh, let's go on and talk about one of those uh, um, major neo avian groups, the uh, gruviforms. Uh, so on the next slide, well, actually, <laughs> before we get to the gruviforms proper, we have to talk about something uh, something else, I guess, or, or several other things else. Um, so <laughs> because the term or the group uh, gruviformes traditionally included um, a large number of other uh, neo-avians um, that we no longer consider to be part of this group. So it, it used to be that a lot of like kind of you know, these ground-dwelling um, neo-avians were included together uh, in the in an expanded uh, Gruviformes. But with the recent, you know, especially genetic studies, uh, we're starting to realize, oh, a, a lot of these um, birds are actually not closely related to the cranes and rails after all. And, and so they, they've been kind of flung to other parts of the bird tree, basically. And so uh, on this slide here, I'm, I'm showing uh, basically a lot of these X gruviforms, uh, groups that used to be included within gruviformes, but are now uh, known to be more closely related to uh, very different groups of birds. And we've talked about some of them before. Uh, so up here we have the mazites, a group of very poorly studied uh, terrestrial birds from Madagascar that are now thought to be more closely related to the pigeons. So together with the pigeons and sand grouse, they uh, form the group columbomorphae. Um, we also talked about the bustards, a group of often very large uh, terrestrial omnivorous birds, and uh, they are now thought to be more closely related to uh, things like cuckoos and maybe the turricos. Now, the, the other birds shown on here we haven't really talked about yet on this series. Um, there is a group called the button quails, uh, which look like quails but are not quails. Uh, they are not uh, chicken-like galliforms, uh, but they are neo-avians. And in fact, they belong to the caradriforms, the shorebirds. So they're closely related to things like gulls and uh, uh, gulls and plovers and uh, sandpipers, uh, and not, not to the cranes and rails. Uh, there is a weird South American bird called the sun bittern, which is closely related to another weird bird from New Caledonia called the kagu. And uh, these two birds were also once thought to be gruviforms, but uh, in recent uh, molecular studies, they are instead found more closely related to, very curiously enough, a group of seagoing birds called the tropic birds. Uh, well, we'll talk about those in a later episode. And then we have the Seriemas, which we kind of briefly mentioned earlier, the closest living relatives of the terror birds. Uh, and they are now thought to be members of Telleravies. So they're more closely related to things like uh, falcons and parrots and songbirds than to the cranes and rails. And so Gruviformes, uh, as we understand it today, uh, is now a much diminished uh, group in terms of its uh, um, composition. And uh, this is also the reason why I uh, decided to call this episode A House Divided, because uh, for a long time, you know, Gruviforms included all these very disparate birds that have now been uh, divided into a, uh, and re redistributed to other parts of the phylogeny. So in this episode, we will focus on the true Gruviformes as we understand them today. Uh, do you have anything else to add about this? Uh, no, I, I definitely uh, <laughs> recognize like the traditional nature of this group. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Again, all the books I had growing up lumped all these together. For sure, um, yeah. <laughs> but slowly but surely, this is kind of getting itself into the popular culture. Right. I think the, uh, the third edition of the big... Dorling Kendersley book, Animal, mm. which I'm sure we all grew up with. Yes. Um, they finally recognize all the different bird groups, and now they're all split in this way. Mm. Mm. That's good. Yeah, I, I still, I, I haven't had a chance to just look at the, the new editions uh, so far. Uh, yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, definitely a very influential book in my childhood. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of a sort of half-assed how they do it, because, <laughs> like, they, they still keep all of the the traditional groups together uh -huh. but i guess to, to save time with editing they put them up on the same page so like right the page, like, rule forms they've just kind of 
boxed all these individual birds together. Right, so right. Like nestled with each other. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe by the, the fourth edition they'll right they'll move them around to the, I guess. Well, it's a polytomy, of course, but they'll they'll, they'll move them around probably. Yeah. Yeah, to maybe to where where their actual closest relatives are. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> But um, on the next slide, we can finally um, introduce the, the gruviforms proper. Um, so gruviforms, uh, as we shall see, uh, do have a you know fairly reasonable fossil record. There there are there are some uh, some fossil groups that are pretty well known, and from all the way back in the Paleocene, of course, they survive into present day. Uh, at least uh, the group that is not not the specific fossil <laughs> species. Um, and there are over 170 living species of gruviforms, and a lot of them are often associated near water. Uh, not always, but many of them do forage near water, and typically they are omnivorous birds. So, um, you know, there there are some variations. Some some of them do specialize in specific types of foods, but many of them are not picky eaters. So they'll eat plant material. Uh, they'll eat uh, any animal they're able to swallow. Um, so uh, yeah. Most mostly omnivorous species. Now the juveniles of gruviforms uh, tend to be what we call semi precocial, and so I think we've talked about a kind of being precocial versus being altricial uh, on this series before. Um, so an animal that is precocial is uh, an animal that is uh, relatively self sufficient when it is uh, when it is born or when it hatches. Uh, so usually precocial animals can walk around, feed themselves as soon as they're born. Uh, many of them don't require any parental care at all. Now, of course, most birds do provide parental care anyway, um, even in the precocial species. But uh, you know, the, those young birds often don't need to be be fed by a parent. They can just follow parent, uh, get some protection from them, but uh, are able to find food by themselves. Um, whereas an altricial animal is uh, an animal that's basically helpless when it's born. So of course, uh, we humans are an example of that. Um, you know, it requires a lot of parental care, it can't, can't really feed themselves. Uh, oftentimes, they can't even really walk properly on their own. Um, and so might might be bound to a nest or have to be carried by a parent. Um, and definitely, there are birds that are altricial as well. Um, now, semi-precocial is a term that is usually applied to birds specifically, and this describes uh, often describes young that are um, are precocial in terms of their development. So, oftentimes they are capable of walking around uh, by themselves for a little bit, uh, or at least for a little bit. But uh, even so, they will often still be fed uh, by a parent. And in some cases, they they might even stay in the nest mostly, even if they're capable of walking around if they want to. Um, and so that, that's kind of the strategy that um, a lot of gruviforms use, is that uh, the young are able to leave the nest uh, very early in their development, but many of the time, many times uh, the parents will, will still be feeding them um, and uh, showing them what foods are good to eat and so on. Now, of course, uh, precociality versus altriciality is a spectrum. Um, now, because I, as I mentioned, uh, most birds pr provide parental care anyway, even even uh, the precocial ones. Uh, so most birds uh, would be considered, you know, more altricial than, say, a sea turtle, which doesn't provide any parental care at all. Um, so it is not is not like an either or thing. It's a spectrum. Uh, but even so, within birds, we recognize these several different um, parts of the spectrum. You could say. And so in, in most gruviforms, you know, we say that they have semi-precocial young. Um, in terms of their anatomical features, uh, the gruviforms uh, share what we say is a hook-like projection behind the lower jaw. So I have a photo of an extinct rail species here, and I have the arrow pointing to, you know, you, you might be able to see it, there's a little hook-shaped structure uh, behind the behind the lower jaw. Uh, so that, that is a feature, yeah, that is a feature shared by uh, most gruviforms. Um, in addition, um, gruviforms uh, also have a very, very long and narrow breastbone, which is the picture on the bottom here, which are two two different gruviforms. And you can see that the, the sternum or breastbone is very, very long and thin, and this gives them a very narrow kind of body profile, which um, in rails especially is helpful uh, when they need to hide in vegetation, so they'll often slip inside a vegetation uh, and you know just disappear basically uh, from from view um 
there i think um in some books uh that i've read it is said that uh the name rail comes from or, or maybe it's like the saying skinny as a rail comes from the birds or, or the birds are named after the saying or something like that um i i it's a it's a it's an interesting idea but i, I think it's not true uh, uh I, I think it's it's been debunked but but still uh tells you tells you something about the um uh, kind of general um body type of these birds um Something else uh, that guru forms tend to share, uh, it, it's not universal, but uh, it's common in many of them, is that they have these ossified tendons along the hind limbs. And ossified tendons are basically tendons that have uh, hardened into bone, basically. Um, now, I don't think it is well understood why they have these ossified tendons, um, but we do know that uh, ossified tendons are often found um, in animals where they are helpful for energy storage during locomotion. So they, they could help make locomotion more efficient uh, by kind of storing energy and then releasing it uh, as the animal moves. And so um, since uh, gruviforms do spend a lot of time, you know, walking around, they're primarily terrestrial birds. Um, it, it may be that these ossified tendons are, are helpful for them in that regard, although I, did, I don't think anyone has done an actual study on that. Um, yeah, so those are some common features of gruviforms. Uh, do you have anything else to, to say before we move on? Uh, nope. Alrighty, so gruviforms come in two major branches. And so first, on the next slide, we're going to talk about the gruoids. Uh, so the gruoids are the, basically the branch that is uh, the cranes and the groups that are more closely related to them. And then the other branch that we'll meet later are the raloids, which are the rails and the, the groups that are more closely related to, to them. So uh, first, let's start with the gruoids. They, they are known from the Eocene onwards. There are almost 20 living species. Uh, so it's not a spectacularly big group, uh, but uh, some of them are spectacular looking, as we will see. Uh, and they share a number of features, such as a very short, stout coracoid. So the coracoid is uh, the image on the right here. Um, so this is a, a bone in the shoulder girdle, which most uh, tetrapods have, but uh, we placental mammals do not have a coracoid. Um, in birds, the coracoid is basically uh, what connects the shoulder blade, the scapula, and the sternum, uh, the breastbone. Uh, so it kind of goes between there. And in gruoids, the coracoid is short and stout, uh, and there's a large opening for an air sac in, in the coracoid. It is labeled FOS in this uh, in this image here. And so um, on the um, on the right is a coracoid from a crane, and on the left is a coracoid from an extinct group of gruoids that we will meet a bit later. So you can see how uh, they are quite similar in shape. In the in the fossil, the coracoid is partially broken, and that's why uh, the tip is missing. But you can see that the shape, the general shape is there. Um, something else that the gruoids share is a laterally slanted hypotarsus. And you might remember the term hypotarsus from all the way back in the first episode of this series. Now, the hypotarsus is a little kind of block-like uh, structure that sticks out of the, um, the tarsometatarsus, which is the main uh, foot bone in modern birds. Um, tarsometatarsus is formed from the fusion of the long bones in the foot, the metatarsi, and the, some of the ankle bones. And uh, at, the, at the base of the tarsometatarsus in modern birds, uh, there is a block-like structure called the hypotarsus that kind of sticks out uh, the bottom of the heel, basically. Um, and uh, it is not really clear why uh, modern birds have a hypotarsus, whereas uh, you know a lot of their uh, uh, non-avian Mesozoic relatives do not. Um, but we do know that the hypotarsus uh, kind of uh, provides uh, a place for a lot of the tendons in the um, in the foot to pass through. Uh, and I mentioned uh, in the first episode that having a hypotarsus with many deep uh, grooves and canals uh, is a feature of crown birds that is not really seen in in um, you know their stem bird relatives. Uh, and in um, in gruoids, the hypotarsus has a particular shape, and so the bottom image here shows um, the left feet of various gruoids. And what you're looking at here is that uh, this is the, the left foot, and you're holding the foot kind of uh, with the tip pointed away. The tip with the toes is pointed away. From, uh, from the viewer, um, or rather the tip where the toes would attach is pointed away from the viewer. 
uh, and so basically you're looking at the surface of the um, the ankle joint here and so um, you will notice that the uh, hypotarsis in gruoids tends to slant kind of upwards the side and this is the um, this is the left foot in all of these uh, so the side the outward side is on the left um, of all of these and so you can see that it forms this distinctive shape um, and so that is a feature of uh, gruoid gruiforms um, now let's meet the various um, kind of major groups of gruoids so on the next slide here, uh, we have one of the, the first of these groups. Uh, these are the trumpeters. Now, apparently uh, trumpeters are named after uh, their loud calls. Although, um, having listened to some recordings myself, I, I don't think they sound particularly trumpet-like, uh, but that's just me, I think. <laughs> uh, you can uh, look them up and decide for yourself. But in any case, uh, trumpeters uh, don't have a really good uh, fossil record, so so far they're only known from Holocene present day, basically. Um, there are only three living species, and they're only found in South America. Now, uh, they are they feed primarily on fruits. So I, I mentioned that some gruiforms do kind of specialize in specific types of food, and the trumpeters are one of these. They, they feed yeah pretty much mostly on fruit. Maybe, maybe they'll eat the occasional insect, but it's not a huge part of their diet. And they tend to live in these uh, uh, small flocks uh, with a uh, dominant female uh that will mate with uh, several males in the group. And then, uh, you know, she lays her eggs in a tree hollow. The young, uh, shortly after they hatch, they will jump to the ground to be with the rest of the group. And uh, all of the group will help take care of the young together. So, uh, yeah, pretty interesting uh, social structure. So, yeah, because they are, uh, you know, these tropical rainforest birds, I think they're... They're not super well studied. Uh, it's pretty, you know, hard to study things in the in the dense jungle. But um, they, uh, we, we know they're out there, and uh, they they can be heard for certainly. Uh, have you uh, ever seen trumpeters in zoos? Um, it is not coming to my mind. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'll, I'll go with the generic probably, but I don't remember. Right. Right. Yeah. That that definitely happens. I. I I'm pretty sure I have seen them. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I have seen them, but they're definitely not super common zoo animals. Uh, so I, I'm sure there's a lot we have to learn uh, about this particular group of gruiforms. They're pretty birds, though. Yeah, you know, yeah, check out. It kind of looks like a bird version of a, of a taper. Oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I, I have not made that connection before, but uh, yeah, it does kind of look like the, the color scheme a Malayan taper would have, or, or half of it would have. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are several different species, but they're, they're all, you know, kind of this kind of dark color with the uh, long, um, uh, long, slightly lighter colors on, on the back, and usually these iridescent patches. Um, so yeah. They are they are quite a quite pretty up close. Um, I don't know why that is? is that more of a, a sexual selection sort of thing, or I, I, counter shading? That's a good question. I'm I'm not sure that is known. Uh, the the iridescence certainly seems to be a display feature, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure what the um, the significance of the contrast in the the dark and light is. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. The um the next group uh, that we'll meet are the limpkins. Although we only have one living species, so it's the limpkin. Um, there are some fragmentary fossils uh, of this lineage uh, that date back to the Oligocene, maybe, uh, but they're they're not very complete, so there's not much we can say about them. Um, and the limpkins are primarily found in, or they they are only found in the Americas, uh, but primarily in South America. Um, though the northernmost part of their range, they get up into Florida, so they, they are found in, in the United States. Um, and the Lipkins are another group that um, have a specialized kind of feeding uh, behavior. Um, they are specialized for feeding on a group of snails called the apple snails. And in fact, the, their distribution lines up pretty well with the dis distribution of apple snails in the Americas. Um, so they'll wander around in swamps and marshes, um, and then you can see that they have this very long and a very slightly curved bill. And they'll, they'll, what they'll do is they'll you, uh, insert the bill into the shell of these apple snails and cut the muscle uh, 
of the snails that attaches them to their shell. So they just kind of, you know, slice that muscle and then they're able to pull out the rest of the snail and eat them. Now, they, they will feed on some other mollusks as well, but primarily their their favorite food is apple snails. So, uh, yeah, interesting, interesting birds. Uh, do you have anything else to add about them? Um, well, I've certainly never seen one. Um, we, we have family in Florida, so mm -hmm. like on the most recent trips, I haven't been able to, to spot any. Mm. Um, I am familiar with them, though, quite a bit, because uh, I remember in like all the books I used to have, they... they the apple snails was always a uh, brought up in regards to conservation. Oh, yeah. It was like there were worries about um, the wetlands being drained and the apple snails were getting rare. So then the limpkins wouldn't have anything to eat. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if that's the total situation, but that, that does ring a bell to me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a, that is a concern. Um, uh, yeah. I, I also haven't seen uh, limpkins before either in, in any kind of um, setting, I think. But um, but yeah, uh, now lim limpkins I think are are not uh, immediate under immediate threat of, of being endangered or extinction. But um, um, the the snail kite um, is uh, is of conservation uh, concern, uh, and it is it is another bird that also specializes in feeding on on apple snails. And yeah, there 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 were um, and probably still are worries uh, about kind of you know. Um, maintaining a healthy population of apple snails for them to eat. So, uh, Did I just use a limpkin for a snail kite then? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, and they, they both do specialize in feeding on apple snails, so uh, if apple snails are gone, they, they, would, be, they would be in trouble either way. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, but, but yeah, definitely. Uh, it seems that apple snails feed, feed a lot of different birds, and so... Um, yeah, uh, they are they are quite ecologically significant. <laughs> Alrighty then. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. Finally, uh, the last um, kind of major living group of gruoids um, are, of course, the cranes, which uh, probably you know most people are more familiar with. Uh, the fossil record of cranes, uh, at least definitively, uh, dates from the Miocene onwards. Uh, there are some older fossils that have been assigned to cranes but uh kind of that um that assignment is pretty questionable for most of them a lot of them are really fragmentary and it, it really isn't clear that they they are cranes um so in terms of the fossil record that we know uh, for sure are probably cranes uh it's miocene onwards uh, there are 15 living species and they can be found on all of the continents except for south america and antarctica and uh, many of them have bare parts on their head and their face for display. So in these uh, red-crowned cranes, which are species found uh, in East Asia, especially uh, Japan, uh, you can see that the, they have kind of the red on top of their heads. Uh, that part is actually bare skin. It's not feathered. And so they, they have this brightly colored patch on their head. Uh, so probably uh, for display purposes. And other, other, um, other cranes have different kind of these uh, patterns of bare patches, um, probably for similar uh, serving a similar function. Um, most cranes have um, a reduced hallux, so the first toe on the foot, uh, which points backwards in most birds for you know, grabbing onto objects, uh, is reduced in, in most cranes. So um, uh, they tend not to perch in trees. Uh, I think the, the main exception to this are the um, crowned cranes of uh, Africa. Uh, and if you don't know what they look like, uh, go look them up because uh, they, they look <laughs> pretty interesting. They have this kind of puff of uh, yellowish feathers on their on their head that looks a bit like a pom-pom. Uh, yeah, quite striking, very striking uh, birds. And so uh, they, they do have kind of a relatively regular size hallux, so they, they are able to perch in trees. But most of the other crane species pretty much spend all of their time on the ground. And uh, cranes, I think, are very well known for their elaborate dancing behavior. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it, it is no surprise that uh, cranes feature so prominently in pretty much all cultures that have coexisted with them. Um, because they, you know, they, they are absolutely beautiful and striking and very graceful um, birds to look at. And so um, cranes tend to mate for life. And they, they'll often kind of maintain their pair bond by kind of dancing with each other. And of course, when they uh, try to attract mates in the first place, they also use dancing to do that. Um, 
And in addition to uh, their dances, they also have these very deep kind of trumpeting calls. And now, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the calls of cranes that I've heard, uh, I would actually describe as being trumpeting, unlike those of the trumpeters. But uh, like I said, you can go look up some recordings for yourself. Um, and in fact, a lot of cranes have these um, very, very long windpipes that kind of amplify their calls. And the windpipes are so long that they kind of coil up uh, inside their, their breastbone, basically. So it's a very, uh, very unusual skeletal feature. Um, there was a uh, Pleistocene crane, so a relatively recently extinct species, that lived on Cuba, um, Antigone cubensis, uh, that was flightless. So we know flightless has evolved at least once in, in cranes. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think most people have certainly heard of cranes and have a general idea of what cranes look like, but they, they do get um, often confused with uh, other, uh, you know, large long-legged, long-necked birds, uh, especially herons. Um, now, now, herons are, are not closely related to cranes. We will not be talking about herons in this episode because they are not gruviforms. Um, uh, and there, there are several um, uh, pretty good ways to tell them apart. Uh, one is that if you see uh, kind of this long-necked, uh, long-legged bird flying in the air and its neck is kind of retracted, so its head is folded up on, on its back, um, that, then it's a more likely to be a heron than a, than a crane because cranes fly with their necks sticking straight out. And also, as mentioned before, um, cranes uh, tend not to perch in trees, uh, whereas herons do. So uh, if you see a, a large bird like that kind of perched in a tree, uh, yeah, it's more likely to be a heron than a crane. Um, and there are, there are other ways to, to tell them apart as well, but uh, some of these uh, behavioral traits are pretty obvious. When I was... Um, when I was uh, living in um, Canada, uh, I used to see um, sandhill cranes, which are uh, um, quite striking. We would, we would go occasionally to a um, nearby uh, a bird sanctuary where uh, wild wild birds would congregate, um, and there were sandhill cranes living there. Um, and kind of, we would often be warned when visiting the sanctuary that uh, cranes could be aggressive uh, during breeding season. So um, when they when they have their young, they will uh, defend their nests quite fiercely. Of course, these are these are quite large birds you know, with very large beaks, and they they also kick as well. Uh, so they are they're quite formidable. Um, and definitely at the time, I, w I was quite little, so uh, I was definitely quite wary, uh, even even frightened of the, of the sandhill cranes when we when we came across them, and was de took def took special care not to approach too closely. Um, have you ever seen uh, cranes uh, in you know in the wild or captivity or otherwise? Oh, definitely. Um, I guess on the on the other side of the continent, um, mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to visit from visiting family in Florida is see the sandhill cranes. Mm, yeah, um, they they would. I don't know if it's just the area or if it's just the times of of the year that we go, but they're fairly laid back birds when yeah. you see them with or without babies so right they'll, they'll walk around on the lawns you know these manicured lawns and they'll just kind of forage here and there and the babies would piddle paddle behind them <laughs> and because it's where my grandparents live yeah they are uh it's near a big golf course so it's they're 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 very used to people yeah so yeah. like mm. not in a way that like you could like walk up and pet mm -hmm. one but like they'll, they'll tolerate your presence at a certain distance right like, I, porch and watch them come by and they they would get fairly close yeah they're they are striking birds i mean for one like they're incredibly tall so yep. you can't miss them <laughs> and they, they uh, when they call it is very distinct so you, you always know when they're around right um, yeah i i like cranes a lot <laughs> and of course uh, i've seen i have seen like crown cranes at, at zoos mm -hmm. before um, they're very charismatic. Yes. We include them with all of the, the African megafauna. Right. Um, and uh, of course, the one time I was able to see a whooping crane, which mm -hmm. was a real treat, was at the, the Sylvan Heights Bird Park. Ah, sweet. <laughs> but I uh, I was trying to take a photograph of one because I'm like, oh my God, it's a whooping crane. This is the bird I've read about. Here. Right. And I get it so the fence was in the way. So I put my little camera like through the, the chain link fence to get a picture of one. <laughs> I didn't know the other one that was approaching was about to snap at my fingers and the camera because I was too close. 
but I caught him in time. Right. Like, okay. <laughs> I got a picture of him. Right. Like, just glaring at me. <laughs> yeah. I like cranes. They're really cool. they they're lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would guess if they're uh, habituated to people, um, they they they're probably uh, less uh, not not so belligerent. Um, but yeah, I, I I imagine the kind of the the people at the bird sanctuary were you know taking special precautions, just warning people not to get too close. I, I'm sure they're they're not like you know super hyper aggressive monsters that will come come after you or anything like that. But um, oh, that's that's no bird. Right, right. It's like geese. Like yeah geese but it's like you just chill then they'll they'll, they'll they, they won't mind you <laughs> Act responsibly, <it's> okay. <laughs> right right um but but yeah um yeah i do know um you know in, in cases where people have had to work up close with with cranes they they, they have been known to to be uh you know fairly uh fairly pugnacious so i i i've even seen i think um or, or heard stories about you know zookeepers who work with cranes and how sometimes they have to go into um, their exhibits with riot gear so <laughs> to avoid injury things like oh, no. yeah <laughs> they carry these shields with them and so on um, yeah and there, there there are several um several species of cranes that are that are endangered unfortunately so uh, they are uh, subject to a uh, captive breeding programs to try and save them um, and in some cases they have to be artificially inseminated. Um, you know, either because uh, they can't find a suitable mate for them, or and so on. Uh, so some sometimes they they do have to get pretty close to the, to the birds, and yeah, that that can be can be dicey. Um, there was a there was actually a, a video like uh, I saw like it's been years at this point, but it was a uh, I I don't remember if it was a a crane that was kept in a in a zoo that that got out of its exhibit or a wild crane. Uh, but either way, it was a crane that ended up in a tiger exhibit. Uh, and yeah, it, well, the, there were two tigers in the zoo exhibit and they of course took interest in the crane as prey. And I, I think that the crane was, might've been injured, so it, it couldn't, it couldn't fly away or anything, but, uh, it basically managed to hold them off until it was rescued by the zookeepers. So yeah, you know, <laughs> cranes are not to be trifled with. Um, I remember this video, yeah. <laughs> like on the on the list of like animals that don't belong in in zoo enclosures and it usually ends up one way or the other way right um, yeah i uh, i certainly want to mess with a crane you know i'm, I'm looking at the beak right like, uh, I inside <laughs> of a crane rather than <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah but um but yeah, definitely, uh, they are lovely to watch from a safe distance. Um, so uh, I think the on the next slide, I have a, an example of a fossil crane. Uh, so there are some really nice uh, crane fossils out there, and this is one of them. This is um, Balerica exigua from the Miocene of um, Nebraska, I think. And so the, this fossil was um, basically preserved, covered in volcanic ash, and that's why it's so complete. You can, so the, the quality of the image is not great because it's a, it's a photocopy of, from, a, from a book, I think. But, um, but you can see it's basically a complete skeleton with the skull on top, and you can make out the neck and the, the main body and the kind of hind limbs sticking out behind it. So uh, yeah, very, um, very striking bird. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the genus... Um, Balerica is actually the genus of the modern uh, crowned cranes, which today are only found in uh, Africa. But uh, because of fossils like this, we know that they used to um, live in North America as well. They once had a much wider uh, distribution. There's a group of uh, fossil gruoids um, that seems to be uh, kind of, um, at least they give us an idea of what type of uh, well, what type of bird the uh, some of the modern groups that might have evolved from, and so this is a group called the Parvi gruids, um, and they're they're known from the Eocene to the Oligocene, so Paleogene birds, and so far I think they've only been found in Europe. And the name uh, Parvi gruids basically means uh, small cranes, and so these are much smaller than uh, modern cranes. Uh, they're only about the size of a chicken, and. Uh, you know, th this is one of the better specimens that are out there, and the the bones are a bit jumbled up, but you might be able to make out that there's a basically complete skeleton here. Uh, there is a skull on top in the kind of schematic. It's labeled SK. Um, you can see the sternum in the middle is labeled ST, and you 
you might be able to tell that it's kind of long and narrow, as we saw in the uh, modern uh, gruiforms. Um, and they're both of the wings are there, and uh, both of the hind limbs are there. It's pretty complete, uh, complete fossil. Uh, this is Parvi goose from the Oligocene of France. Um, we're pretty sure they are gruoids, uh, although um, uh, analyses have differed as to where in the gruoids they belong. So they might be stem gruoids, in which case they would be you know equally close to all the living gruoids. Um, but they might also be. Um, more closely related to limpkins and cranes than to trumpeters, uh, and they share with limpkins and cranes several features, including uh, they have very long, slit-like nostril openings in the skull, um, and I, I think that is um, that tends to be where more recent analyses put them, uh, closer to limpkins and cranes. Um, in any case, uh, uh, pretty um, pretty nice how we get a look at the ancestral condition for these birds in these guys. Before before we move on to Ralloids, there are a couple of kind of enigmatic uh, gruoid-like fossil birds um, in the fossil record. I guess that's redundant, but um, uh, there there are several groups of gruoid-like birds that we should probably talk about. Um, so one of these groups uh, is a group called the Geranoidids, um, and they are only known so far from the Eocene of North America. And so far, they're only known from hind limb bones. So the example shown here um, is actually one of the more complete specimens that we have, which is saying something. Uh, but, you know, we, we have most of a hind limb here. Um, so the kind of almost horizontal bone on top is the femur or thigh bone. And connected to it here is the, um, the shin, which is um, uh, called the tibiotarsus in birds. And then uh, kind of separated on the uh, right there is the, the tarsometatarsus, so the, the long bones of the foot. And the scale bar there, I think, is five centimeters. So these were pretty decently sized birds. You know, the, if you measure the, kind of the, the whole hind limb length here, this particular gerinoided, um, which incidentally, we're, we're not sure um, which species it belongs to because they're also incomplete that it's very hard to compare between them. Um, in any case, uh, this particular specimen uh, probably would have, you know, been over like two feet tall, at least, uh, you know, just just from measuring the, the length of the hind limbs, and probably there would be a bit of extra height from the hip and so on. Um, so pr pretty good sized birds here. Now, uh, traditionally, the gerinoidids um, have been considered gruoids, but there was a recent study that looked at the hind limb anatomy of the paleotidids. And if you have a good memory, you might recall from the Paleonate episode that the um, Paleotidids are a group of early uh, flightless Paleonates. Um, so they belong to the kind of the ostrich-like birds. Uh, it is not clear which group of uh, uh, modern Paleonates are most closely related to, if any. But um, you know, they they were around, uh, and uh, it turns out that um, some of their hind limb anatomy is pretty similar to the Geronoidids. And so it has recently been suggested that actually maybe the gerinoidids are a type of paleonate, uh, closely related to the paleotidids. And so if that's the case, then maybe they're not gruviforms at all. Um, and well, it, it's really hard to say because, again, we only have hind limb bones from the gerinoidids, so we don't really know what the rest of them look like. Um, a lot of the features that uh, characterize paleonates that have been identified are skull features, and we don't have skulls of gerinoidids. Uh, so, you know, kind of... Uh, for the time being, they kind of remain mystery birds. Uh, hopefully someday we'll find more complete skeletons that will shed more light on this. Uh, on the next slide, I have a, uh, another group of gruoid-like uh, mystery birds, and these are the eogruids. And uh, they're also, you know, pretty large birds with long legs, and they, they know, they're known from a wider, uh, longer time range than um, the geronoidids. Uh, they're known from the Eocene all the way up to the Pliocene. Uh, so far, they've only been found in Europe and Asia, especially Asia. There are many species known from Central Asia. And they were once thought to be stem ostriches. Um, and if you know ostrich anatomy, you might be able to tell why. Uh, the reason for this, uh, or at least the main reason for this, is because the later species of eogruids uh, reduced the second toe on their foot. Uh, in fact, uh, lost it eventually completely. And uh, so... Birds uh, in general, uh, modern birds, uh, have basically uh, four-toed feet, um, and uh, 
so that's a way uh, mo most birds have it, uh, four-toed feet with the hallux pointing backwards. Um, and in, uh, in Eogruids, the, the first toe has been lost, and the, the later in later species, the second toe has been, been lost as well. So only the two outer toes are left. And this is a feature that is only seen in um, ostriches among birds, uh, among other birds. Uh, which is probably an ad adaptation for fast running. Uh, you, well, I think we talked about this when we talked about ostriches, but you, you kind of see a parallel in some uh, mammal groups that are adapted for running, especially things like horses, which have reduced uh, their toes to having only a single toe on each foot. Um, and so kind of this kind of toe reduction is seen in many kind of fast running animals. And so uh, because of this, uh, eogruids were once thought to be stem ostriches. Um, some later studies considered them more likely to be uh, gruiforms, but uh, they they do share a number of features of the gerinoidids, and it has you know long been thought that they are probably closely related to the gerinoidids. Uh, in which case, if gerinoidids are not gruiforms, then maybe the eogruids are not either. Um, I think the, the case for eogruids not being gruiforms is not as uh, not as strong as the, it, with the gerinoidids, but also the case for them being gruiforms is not that strong anyway to begin with. Um, so definitely they they are a, they are also another group of mystery birds. It, it would be very ironic if they also turned out to be paleonates because that would actually make them you know relatively close to ostriches, and that, that could in fact open up the doors two of them being stem ostriches again, um, but I guess we will just have to see. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe if, if they have anything to do with group forms, maybe they're like a stem group that's a way back in time. Right, yeah. Kind of doing their own thing. Right, exactly. Yeah, hard to say at the moment because... Um, I, I guess I, I did mention on the slide, but um, eogruids are also known only from hind limb material, so we don't really know what the rest of them look like. Well, okay, there there are a few scraps of bones that have been uh, assigned to them uh, that aren't hind limb bones, as as possible um, remains of of eogruids. But you know, because we don't have like a complete associated skeleton, uh, it, it's very hard to say whether or not those those other pieces actually belong to eogruids. Um, they 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 were basically assigned to eogruids on the basis that they are large bird bones basically like oh eogruids are found in this region and so uh, maybe these are eogruid bones and they they don't seem to be obviously any other group but um yeah uh because they're they're known primarily from hind limb material it's very hard to to say definitively what they are all right so now we're at the um we're at the other major lineage of uh, gruiforms the ralloids now. Ralloid fossil record, as we still see, uh, extends back into the Paleocene. Uh, so uh, they are known from fairly ancient fossils. Uh, and there are over 100 living species, so far more diverse than the Gruoids. And they have a number of uh, features that characterize them. So uh, in the humerus, the upper arm bone, they don't have an air sac opening, which most other uh, modern birds have. And... Uh, they also have a characteristic um, morphology of the hypotarsus, which we mentioned earlier. So again, here we have an image of a left foot, and you're looking at the surface of the ankle joint with the, the tip of the foot pointing away from us. Um, and so in the, um, in the Ralloids, um, the hypotarsus has a deep canal for the tendons that flex the second toe in the foot, so the, um, the second innermost uh, toe. Um, so on on the figure here, these are labeled FP two and FPP two. Um, these are for these are two tendons that flex the, the second toe, and in Ralloids, uh, these tendons run through a deep canal or a furrow, uh, and on the on the side of them, they are bordered by a tall uh, crest of bone. So this is the case in all of these uh, Ralloids, as you can see here. And so uh, another. Um, another uh, kind of phylogenetically informative uh, hypotarsis uh, anatomy seen in this group. Um, all right, let's meet some of the major uh, recent groups of ralloids. All right, so uh, 
the next slide, uh, our first group, is a pretty weird group. The, this group is called the Finfoots. Um, they, they have a fossil record extending to the Miocene, but uh, those, the quality or you know, the completeness of those fossils is, is not great, so again, not, not too much we can say about them. Um, and in the modern day, there are only three living species. Um, one in the Neotropics, one in Africa, and one in Asia, although their fossils have been found in Northern America, so, you know, the non-tropical parts of North America. Um, and there's a possible one from Europe as well. The finfoots, as you can see in the image here, uh, are often found swimming on the water surface. And uh, something interesting about them, as well as um, some of the other um, kind of more aquatically adapted ralloids, is that they don't have uh, webbed feet. Instead, they have uh, lobed feet, uh, which we have seen previously with the grebes. Now, the grebes, of course, are not closely related to the gruiforms, but um, they've kind of independently developed uh, kind of these flappy, flappy toes uh, with kind of a fringe around them, as I think we call these lobed feet. Um, and so instead of webbed feet, they use they have a this structure of a uh, unusual swimming foot. Uh, now, even though finfoots spend a lot of time in the water, they are quite competent at walking, so they walk around on land just fine. Um, and they're also, you know, they, they also um, use their large feet for climbing through the branches. And what they often do is that they they like to they like to they're, they're the tropical birds, so they like to swim in um, in waters that have a lot of kind of vegetation uh, covering them, like from you know overhanging tree branches and things like that. And sometimes when they are disturbed, what they'll do is they'll kind of hop up onto the branches overhead and just climb through the branches uh, out of sight. Um, and because of these kind of secretive habits, the finfoots are not very um, well studied. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know about them, um, even though they're very unusual birds and certainly, uh, for sure, deserve more study. Um, something that is especially weird that I couldn't not mention is that there is one particular species of finfoot with a super uh, unusual feature not found, as far as we know, in any other bird. Uh, this is the sun grebe. Uh, this is the neotropical uh, finfoot species. Uh, so unlike other gruiforms, which we mentioned, have semi-precocial young, the sun grebe has altricial young, so they're helpless at, when they're hatched. And the particularly unusual part is that the males uh, of the sun grebe have uh, these pouches on either side of their body. So they have this fold of skin on either side of their body. So on, basically, it, it would be uh, covered by their wings most of the time, but uh, they can raise their wings up and um, expose these uh, these pouches. And uh, what they'll do is they're actually able to carry their young uh, in these pouches, even while they're flying. And so this is super unusual. Uh, so not only for having the pouches in the first place, um, but also, you know, there, there aren't many birds that carry their young in flight at all. Uh, and as far as we know, no other bird has this kind of structure. Um, and again, because uh, this group is not very well studied, there's a lot that we don't actually know about, uh, you know, how these pouches work, basically, because these um, the babies are helpless. So we, we don't actually know how the babies get into the pouch in the first place. We just know that they're used to carry the young. Are there photos of this pouch? Yes, there there are photos of this pouch in the in the original um, paper that described the structure. Uh, there there is a photo of a, a young sun grebe uh, being inside the pouch, uh, and there there's also a diagram showing kind of how it how it sits in the pouch and all that. But yeah, they're, they're very very rare. There uh, as that is the only I think photo of this that I've seen, which was in the original paper that uh, that described this, and. Uh, I think that paper was written in like the 1970s or something. So right. yeah. I, I found on the Google image search, yeah. of course, our good friend Darren Nace yeah. written an article about it. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. There's all the pictures. Wow, this is weird. Okay, so so I guess it's the skin fold and I guess it's covered in feathers. And... Right. Wow, that is... Okay. <laughs> I, I was not familiar with this. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think it is mentioned in the paper that uh, this, this structure was just undiscovered for a long time uh, because uh, in dead birds where the, you know, that have basically dried up, uh, it is, the pouches are not very obvious. Uh, you, like, so if you're examining like skins of these preserved in museums, uh, you might not notice them. Um, so it basically took uh, kind of looking at living birds to, to 
find out that there was such a thing. Um, yeah, super, super weird. So uh, I, I do hope uh, there are more uh, more field studies on, on finfoots in the future. Um, as far as we know, the other two uh, finfoot species uh, don't have this, this structure. Uh, and I think people have looked. Um, but yeah, weird, weird birds. Now, is the, uh, the sun grebe aquatic too? Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 all of them are, are pretty much uh, similarly aquatic, like spending a lot of time in the water. Okay, so they, they must have a way, the, the pouches must be high enough on the body that the, the young aren't like, yeah, smothered. Or, right, or I think so. Down. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> Indeed. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, it's it's a shame that finfoots are not not better known. They are super weird birds. Gosh, can you imagine if we had pouches like that? <laughs> right, <laughs> hey, built built in baby harness. <laughs> we can just hide things. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ooh, I got a spec Evo universe where marsupials evolved into sapient forms. <laughs> You know what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Abby Howard made that joke. Oh, yeah. One, yeah the uh, Earth Before Us right. book. Right. Excellent the series. Last. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you can put all your pencils and your in your wallet and your cat in there and just <laughs> whenever you need it. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> but that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next group. Uh, right, so the next group are the fluff tails. Um, now the fluff tails don't have a definitive fossil record that we know of, so that's why I put them as only Holocene here. But there are some um, some fossil um, raloids where people have pointed out some similarities to uh, to modern fluff tails. So it, it may be that we do actually have a, a fluff fluff tail fossils. Uh, we just uh, haven't fully recognized them yet. Uh, there are only 15 living species that uh, we recognize so far, um, and they are found in Africa, including Madagascar, uh, New Guinea, and the Maluku Islands, which I, I think are uh, part of the Indonesian archipelago. Um, and we don't know too much about them, uh, partly because they're, they're often found in you know, remote jungles and things like that, but um, also because uh, until recently, we didn't really recognize the fluff tails as a, as a thing, I guess, uh, because they were once thought to be rails. But then people started doing the genetic studies, and it turns out that the fluff tails are actually a distinct group that are more closely related to the finfoots. Um, now, many of these species are very poorly studied, and so even even quite recently, we're still uh, finding out that certain species that we didn't realize were fluff tails are fluff tails. Uh, so like the, the species from the New Guinea and Indonesia that I uh, kind of alluded to there, um, it was only... Um, it was only this year, I think, the beginning of this year, where uh, there was a new phylogenetic uh, study uh, that provided the first genetic evidence that they are fluff tails. Um, that, now, to be fair, uh, it actually had been suspected previously, based on morphology, that uh, those species were closely related to, um, to fluff tails. Um, but uh, it's just that people had not sampled their genetics previously, and so there wasn't any independent kind of genetic confirmation of this. Um, and so we now recognize uh, 15 living species, um, and who knows, maybe there will be others out there that we, we haven't recognized yet. Um, and uh, both, both in the um, modern day and in the fossil record. So unfortunately, because um, uh, we don't know much about them. There, there's not too much uh, I, I have to say about them here. Uh, but do you have anything to add? I guess, the, do they actually have fluffy hair? <laughs> kind of. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think it, it's super obvious or anything. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the name the name fluff tail makes you think, oh, there's this huge kind of puff of a tail or something like that. But yeah, it, it's it's not super obvious. They, they basically look like a, look like rails. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure as we, uh, as we learn more about them, we will start figuring out some of the differences between these guys and, and true rails and understand that a bit better. Yeah, I hope so too. They're mm -hmm. cool looking birds. They are, yeah. <laughs> so, let's see. Next slide. Uh-huh. Uh, 
So here's a very unusual group. Um, unfortunately, uh, this group, the AIDS bills, are recently extinct. Uh, they died out in historical times. Now they are known in the fossil record from the Miocene, but these are super fragmentary, like like there are few vertebrae and fragments of other bones. Not much can be said about their early evolution, um, but uh, they are much better known from their more recent remains, from the Pleistocene and the Holocene. So we know that there were uh, two recent species, and they were found on New Zealand, and so one lived on uh, nor the North Island of New Zealand, and one lived on the South Island. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, they you know died out shortly after human arrival, and uh, as far as we can tell, they don't seem to have had very large populations to begin with. Uh, so, quite likely that they were quickly you know hunted to extinction. Um, and these were um, large, flightless birds, uh, so they could weigh up to around twenty kilograms. Uh, pretty good sized birds. Uh, not not as big as moa, which we've talked before talked about before. Um, at least not as big as the, the larger species of moa, but about the same size as the smallest moa species. And uh, unlike the moa, um, they were probably not herbivores. Uh, instead, uh, they seem to have been predatory. So um, we know this um, uh, in part from isotope studies. Uh, so uh, basically looking at the chemical composition of their bones, uh, you can often tell uh, what an animal eats because you are what you eat, uh, what you eat gets incorporated into your tissues. And so based on isotope studies, uh, AIDS bills were predatory, at least in part. So they, they definitely ate, you know, animals fairly high on the food chain. Um, probably they ate uh, large insects, maybe smaller birds, uh, lizards, tuataras, things like that, uh, anything they could catch. And you can see that they have this very robust curved bill that they could have used to to uh, capture and kill prey and dig them out of uh, logs, maybe, or dig them out of burrows. Um, it has also been speculated that they, they could have dug for roots and things as well, so maybe they were omnivorous, um, which would be in keeping with uh, being gruiforms. And the, these would have been one of the major kind of predators of their uh, of their ecosystem uh, prior to the arrival of humans. Uh, probably, probably the only threat to them, again, prior to the arrival of humans would have been the Haas seagull, which was a gigantic eagle that lived in lived on New Zealand, um, and also probably died out shortly after human arrival. Now, when it comes to the uh, phylogenetic position of the AIDS bills, um, it has been very um, contentious, and you, you, can, you might be able to guess why, because these are, these are really weird birds with very unusual anatomies. Uh, and so again, we kind of run into this problem of a, of a bird or you know, any organism that is highly modified uh, from whatever its ancestors were like, uh, it can often be very hard to tell uh, what its uh, closest relatives are. And so historically, they have been considered closely related to galliforms, the chicken-like birds, um, or to the sun bittern and kagu, which belong to a group called Uripygiforms. But more recent studies seem to suggest that they are actually gruiforms. Um, but what kind of gruiform they are has also been contentious. Um, so there was a pretty recent um, large uh, study that assembled many uh, morphological traits, many uh, anatomical traits of birds, and included AIDS bills, and found them as the sister to trumpeters, which would be pretty interesting. Uh, in that case, I would make uh, AIDS bills gruoids. However, uh, another study that uh, you know came out around the same time, actually, um, uh, this one, they managed to extract a mitochondrial DNA from the recent you know, bones that we have and uh, instead found them sister to the fluff tails, um, and in which case the AIDS bills would be ralloids. Um, yeah, it's uh, still still up for some debate. Um, there, there was another recent study, actually, that found a morphological support for um, AIDS bills being... Um, closely related to fluff tails, actually. Um, so they, they found that um, the hypotarsis, there's, there's that structure again, um, the hypotarsis anatomy of AIDS bills has similarities to um, uh, those of um, fin foots and fluff tails specifically. And so uh, in that case, that, that does seem to support those affinities. Um, in any case, it's a pretty interesting uh, biogeographic story because um, AIDS bills so far have only been found on New Zealand, um, whereas the uh, fluff tails uh, were found in Africa and uh, you know, New Guinea and Indonesia. 
So that kind of, you know, raises the question, where did their last common ancestor live? Um, you know, hard to say. Uh, probably somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you know, if I were to speculate, I want to guess maybe Antarctica. Um, and uh, because Antarctica is covered up in ice now, uh, we don't really have a good idea of what a lot of its kind of recent uh, Cenozoic history is like because, you know, any fossil deposits that are that might be there are buried underneath the, underneath the, the ice. But, um, you know, it hasn't always been this way. Um, early Earlier in the Cenozoic, uh, Antarctica uh, would not have been covered in ice. And uh, maybe at the time, uh, the ancestors of um, the AIDS, the common ancestor of AIDS bills and fluff tails was living there and uh, some of them dispersed to New Zealand, others to, to Africa. Uh, and uh, gave rise to their more recent uh, groups that are now uh, very uh, both geographically and anatomically distinct from each other. Um, so, yeah, uh, hopefully we'll we'll find out more about this eventually in the future. But in any case, AIDS bills are definitely very striking and unusual birds, uh, and it's a shame that we don't have them around anymore. Um, do you have anything else to to say about them? Oh gosh, uh, I swear we could do a whole episode <laughs> on Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just involved in a Twitter conversation the other day, actually, oh, yeah? about this. It was concerning a, a group of bats, mm. how maybe to explain their radiation on certain continents, like they, they diversified in Antarctica mm. and then subsequently went their separate ways. Huh. Um, gosh, it, it, yeah, there are so many... There are so many cool things about Antarctica's history that, you know, a lot of the answers that we're probably looking for regarding these things right. are, are just there under the ice. <laughs> somehow getting, get, getting to those deposits and, and, and unveiling some secrets. Oh, know? right, right. Wow. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what we see. But I guess in the meantime, uh, we can go on to the next group of ralloids and i think this is the last um, recent group um so these are of course the rails um now the rail fossil record extends back to at least the oligocene um it, it is possible that some fossils that we're calling a uh, fossil rails are actually um stem fluff tails or uh maybe even stem ralloids or whatever because you know un until recently we weren't really clear on all those differences um but in any case, uh, we do know that rail-like birds extend pretty far back, uh, and there are over 130 living species. So they are more diverse than all the other living groups of gruviforms combined. Uh, and they are found on every continent except for Antarctica, uh, at least today. Um, and rails, most rails are pretty secretive birds. Like, uh, there, there are some exceptions. Um, if you... In many parts of the world, you might be familiar with coots and moorhens. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they can be quite conspicuous. They'll often, you know, swim around on the surface of the water out in the open, like, like ducks do, even though they're, they're not ducks. Um, and if they, if they ever, if you get to observe them get up out of the water, you'll see that they have these lobed feet, not like the webbed feet that a duck has. Um, but, you know, other than those guys, I, I, you know, as a joke, I like to call uh, uh, coots some um, extroverted rails because they're kind of the odd ones out in that regard uh, among this group. Uh, but most of the other rails are very secretive birds, and it it is a big deal if you get to see them because, yeah, the, most of the time they're going to be hiding in waterside vegetation uh, where you're not going to see them. Um, and, yeah, like I, I mentioned earlier about how you know, kind of the narrow profile that gruiforms have kind of helps them slip into vegetation and hide there. And that's definitely something that rails are very, very good at. Um, something else they'll also do is uh, they also like to uh, sink into the water kind of silently, like little little submersibles, <laughs> and, and they hide underneath the water there uh, if they, if they um, you know, detect a predator lurking nearby. Um, so yeah, they're very good at a hide and seek game, and uh, yeah, it, it is very difficult to observe many species of rails. Because I remember growing up uh, reading in a lot of books about corn crakes. Ah, uh, yeah. It was always an issue to like let people know, like, oh, by the way, be careful where you step mm. because there might be corn crakes just hanging out in like the tall grass. <laughs> wow. And like it was a it was a big deal to like combat. Yeah, you know, I, re I remember that very well. Yeah. Um, 
but I definitely um, I, I agree with you on on the thing about coots. Uh, <laughs> I, I, those I do see quite a bit, right? And it's not a point where I can actually tell, you know, when it's a coot and when it's a duck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're cute little birds. They, they are, yeah. <laughs> But yes, uh, now you might not be able to guess from observing them uh, in the field, but uh, rails are actually pretty good flyers. Uh, now they don't like to fly much, and if you if you see one fly, that that is also a big deal because that's gonna, that's a pretty rare sight. Uh, in fact, um, uh, a lot of them do most of their flying by night. So there there are several species that are migratory, but um, they migrate at night, so people don't usually actually see them doing it. Uh, they just suddenly show up in, at a new body of water, and there they are. Um, or rather, there they aren't if you don't get to actually see them, because, uh, yeah. Um, despite this, uh, they, they're they actually quite good flyers and can fly for uh, very long distances. Um, and because of this, uh, rails have colonized, like, many remote islands, like, you know, islands out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, like, all those very remote Pacific islands. Uh, they're pretty, most of them have some species of rail living on them. Um, or many of them do, at least. Something else kind of related to this is that even though rails are good at getting to places, uh, they are also very quick to actually give up being able to fly. Um, and, it, you know, look, looking at how their lifestyle is, um, you might be able to see see why. Because mo most of the time, other than, you know, migration and maybe, you know, in a desperate, uh, if, if they're desperate enough, uh, they they don't really need to fly most of the time. Uh, and e even if they, even if they are trying to escape from predators, they prefer to either hide in vegetation or in the water instead. Um, when they end up in, um, um, environments where, uh, flight becomes, you know, pretty much entirely unnecessary, like tropical islands, uh, they often become flightless pretty quickly. Um, uh, and so rails are quite remarkable in that, they have evolved flightlessness over 30 times independently. And uh, this is, I, I suspect this is an underestimate, because th this is the number I often see quoted, but uh, we, we still find, uh, you know, new species of fossil rails that are um, recently extinct, um, that lived on various islands um, all the time. We're still finding new species. Uh, so I, I think at this point, it's, we're probably looking at more like 40 or 50 times of independent flightlessness. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, because of this, uh, a lot of these flightless rails have gone extinct uh, relatively recently, shortly after, again, human colonization of the islands that they lived on. Um, but there are still a few species of these flightless rails alive today. Yeah, in fact, uh, there is one particular species of rail, which I, I think in a study um, quite recently, it was probably last year, I think, uh, it was shown that part, this particular species of rail, uh, called the white-throated rail, um, it, it is found on Madagascar and some of the other um, islands nearby, um, it might have evolved flightlessness um, twice in the same species. Um, and so in the living populations of white-throated rails, um, the population that lives on Aldabra, the island Aldabra, uh, is uh, flightless, uh, but the others are not. And so uh, there, there's fossil evidence that there used to be uh, a population of flightless rails, probably of this species, or at least a close relative that lived on Aldabra uh, during the Pleistocene. But um, at one point uh, during the Pleistocene, the sea levels rose and uh, and covered up Aldabra, which of course, you know, removed the habitat for the rails and they probably died out. But when Aldabra became exposed again, um, this this species of white-throated rail colonized it again and became flightless again on the same island. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that tells you something about pro the propensity for them to evolve flightlessness. Um, there were there unfortunately there there were some uh, pretty terrible um, headlines regarding this discovery uh, back when it came out like oh god i try to remember like there there was there were some that were like uh, oh this bird re-evolved itself into existence or something like oh, <laughs> like no 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 that that's that's not what happened but still it's it's a very remarkable um, evolutionary story there's probably a lot that could be said about this, um, but um, I think uh, we should probably continue on to the um, 
to the next slide. Although, before we do that, uh, do you have anything else to say about Rails in general? I do remember growing up reading about the, the Takahe. Yeah, yes. I, I believe it is a flightless rail. That's um, correct. Yep. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, an amazing bird. Because I, I, I believe it was, oh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. Like, I think it was Lazarus Taxon. Yeah, that's right. Point. Yep. Mm. Because we, we thought that they had died out and then we found more of them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty remarkable story. So yeah, the Takahe is a um, uh, a flightless rail from uh, New Zealand, and it I, I think it's the biggest uh, living rail. In fact, so it's a big chunky bird, um, and uh, it's specialized uh, for feeding on grasses and things. So it has this big beak that uses the crop grasses, um, and yeah, uh, I I think in fact the story goes um, is that uh, it was actually originally described from fossil material, uh, and then it was discovered alive. Uh, and then thought to have gone extinct, but then rediscovered alive again. Uh, yeah. Got it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that 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 is amazing. Um, uh, and def definitely there are um, efforts uh, underway to conserve it so it does not go extinct for real within our our lifetimes or for rail even. Right. I definitely wish though that uh, as much as as, as cool the talk of hay is, like I wish, like I didn't get the spotlight all the time. Mm -hmm. Because like, I only learned like just recently that there were so many kinds of flightless rails. Mm. Usually, the Takahe is the one that is that is mentioned. Like, oh, there there are flightless rails, including the Takahe. <laughs> That's what you hear about it. Right, right. Yeah, so there's other ones. But they're fascinating in their own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, and there there are definitely many uh, many species out there, uh, e even discounting all the the many uh, recently extinct ones. Yeah, there are quite quite a few that are still with us. Uh, and yeah, there there are definitely um, definitely efforts underway to conserve um, many of them. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we won't lose any more. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So here here are some examples of recently extinct uh, flightless rails. Um, both of these are from New Zealand, or you know, technically surrounding islands of New Zealand. Um, so one of them that's actually from New Zealand is uh, the one on the left, the New Zealand snipe rail, Capelli rallis. And you can see that this particular species has a super long bill. Uh, so it is thought that it uses this long bill for kind of probing for food in the ground and things like that. Um, the other one that I've shown here is a Diaphoraptorix uh, from the Chatham Islands, uh, near New, Ze New Zealand, but not on, not on one of the big islands. Um, and uh, this is a pretty decently sized uh, flightless rail. Uh, it's about the size of a chicken. Yeah, it's a. It also has this rather um, rather stout bill that is thought to have been used for kind of digging maybe insects out from the from rotting logs and things like that. Although certainly it was big enough to go after slightly larger prey as well, so it might have hunted seabirds and things, or or at least the juveniles of seabirds. We do know some things about the behavior of uh, this particular species from oral traditions of natives on these islands. Uh, it, is, it is said that uh, the bird apparently could not see directly in front of it. Uh, so apparently you could just, yeah, walk straight up. Uh, if you if you approach it from, from the front, you can walk straight up to it and, you know, basically kill it uh, if you wanted to. Um, but if you approach from the side or from, from behind, it will quickly see you and run away. Um, but yeah, in any case, uh, because people quickly figured out how to catch them, uh, it, I suppose it wasn't long before it died out. And yeah, unfortunately, uh, there are uh, many, many uh, other uh, flightless rail species that have met similar fates. So uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide here. All right, so there, there's a quite diverse group of uh, probably raloids, uh, fossil raloids, um, that are known from the Paleocene to the Oligocene, so Paleogene. Um, and this is the Messalernithids. Uh, they're, of course, named after the fossil site in Germany called Messel, from, from which uh, a lot of um, a lot of spectacular fossil bird specimens have been found. Uh, they, in addition to Meso, they are known from many other sites as well. So they're found in various places in Europe. Uh, they're also known from, uh, from China, so in Asia, uh, as well as in North America. And uh, they are very abundant at some fossil sites. Um, so Mesolornis, I think, is known from literally hundreds of specimens. Uh, so I, I think it is pretty much the most abundantly known um, paleogene bird. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of fossils of these guys. 
And so it, it seems that you know they, there were many of them that just hung around the lakes and things, and then uh, when they died, they got preserved in the in the lakes, and so we get all these fossils of them. Um, there is evidence from uh, gut contents that a uh, Mesolornis ate both uh, fish and seeds. So um, if uh, this is interpreted correctly, then uh, they seem to have had uh, om an omnivorous diet, uh, similar to their modern close relatives. Uh, so kind of the early uh, papers that described the Mesol Mesolornithids uh, considered them to be close relatives of the Uripygiforms, uh, the uh, Sun Bittern and the Kagu. Again, we, we haven't really talked about them yet, but we will eventually. Um, but more recent studies have found that they are more likely to be uh, stem raloids. Uh, they share various features with, uh, with raloids, including the, the kind of the, the lack of the, the air sac opening in the humerus and the, the distinctive hypotarsis shape that I mentioned earlier. Um, whereas they, they don't really seem to share as many um, clear uh, features with the uh, Europygiforms. Uh, and uh, in most phylogenetic analyses, they come out as a stem raloid, so they would be equally close to all the living raloid groups. Uh, they're not part of the modern radiation, but they probably do represent some, something similar to what the modern raloids evolved from. And on the next slide, I kind of show as a wrap-up um, the phylogeny of gruiforms. And so you can see here that how a gruiforms is divided into the gruoids and raloids. Uh, the gruoids include the trumpeters, limpkins, and cranes among the living groups. Uh, we have the parvigruids, which um, might be uh, stem members of the lineage leading to limpkins and cranes, though they could, could be stem gruoids. Uh, that, that's been found in some studies. Um, I, I didn't include the, um, the geranoidids and uh, eogruids here because the uh, I think uh, their their position is just too uh, uncertain to really be, be sure about it at this time. Whereas in the Raloids, uh, we have the Finfoots, Fucktails, and Rails as uh, the living representatives. Uh, the AIDS bills, which, uh, you know, according to genetic data at least, uh, might be closely related to the Fucktails, recently extinct. We missed them by that much. Uh, and then we have the Mesolornithids, um, which uh, seem to be stem Raloids. All right, so uh, do you have anything else to say about gruiforms before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think this is certainly one of the more uh, underappreciated mm -hmm. bird groups, in my opinion. I mean, you have cranes and you have some of the kinds of rails, but you have all these other amazing birds that I, I wish had more, I guess, press in the popular culture. Mm -hmm. and certainly were, were more better known. Yeah. Bucktails and the Finfoots, for example. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. A lot, a lot of these are, you know, not not only under underrepresented in in popular culture, but also in the scientific research as well. So, uh, I definitely hope that um, you know, we we get to learn more about them, and there there is more focus on them in the in the future. Um, where we're definitely still learning a lot of things, uh, even very basic things about their biology uh, in regards to many of these species. So definitely, yeah, I, I definitely agree that this is one of the most underappreciated bird groups. As for next time, on the next slide here, uh, I, I think you're going to look forward to the next uh, next episode of this series. Um, so we're, we're going to look at a, another group, uh, and this is a very diverse group. These are the Caradriforms, or the shorebirds. And they include things like the gulls and the, the ox and the sandpipers and many other groups. Uh, so they're you know they're often called the shorebirds, but uh, they're they're actually uh, very diverse in their ecology. So you have forms that live inland, far from water, and you have forms that spend most of their time far out at sea, um, very far from the coast. So uh, we're gonna cover them next time, and uh, you know I I think you'll look forward to them because of course the the kill deer is a plover and a member of this group, and uh, yeah we'll <laughs> we'll we'll be uh we'll be discussing it and its uh, close relatives in the next episode. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and of course, immediately after that uh, will be the next episode of the Human Evolution series. Yep, the final episode of the year. Talking about Homo erectus and its relatives. So uh, we're ending on a ending on a fun note for sure. Yeah, definitely. So yes, uh, we'll see you again next week uh, for that one, and then we'll take a break from the rest of the year. Um, so for acknowledgments, uh, yeah, as usual, we'll thank our uh, friends Henry and Alicia for the music and my, uh, my color scheme. Um, 
And uh, you can follow us on Twitter to find out when there's a new episode. Uh, if you liked this episode, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, if you have questions for us, you can uh, send us an email. You can also uh, leave some comments. Uh, I've, I've actually noticed that we have been receiving some comments on uh, some of our videos. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's cool. Uh, keep them coming. Um, and uh, as usual, uh, I'll have a link to uh, the references that I used uh, for this episode in the description. And with that, uh, yeah, we'll see you again for uh, our final episode of the year next time. Uh, take care, everybody. Yeah, see y'all soon.